how do you build a high-performing culture? This is Culture Architects. Candid conversations with extraordinary leaders sharing their biggest successes, failures, and lessons learned on their culture journeys. Here's David J. Friedman. Welcome back to my conversation with Saul Blinkoff, Disney animator, Hollywood director and producer, and life coach. In the first part of this interview, we talked about Saul's beginnings in animation. We also got into the idea of culture building with creatives. Now he's going to share more of his experiences in leadership and culture building across different studios and film projects. And we're also going to learn about his biggest learning about culture from his decades long career in animation. You know, I remember I had an ex interesting experience a number of years ago. Um, my wife and I had the chance to build our own home. And I say build our own home, meaning hire people to build our own home. Right, not yeah, like yeah. Physically build our own home. <laughs> right. um, but we, we were working with an architect to design the house that we wanted to, our dream house that we wanted to live in, which is a wonderful place. And I remember him saying something to me about creativity that just sort of struck a chord in me. And he said that to a certain extent, having parameters generates greater creativity. In other words, if you said to me, you know, build the whole, build, you know, a beautiful house and you have unlimited money and unlimited everything and unlimited time, that's actually harder. That it, it, it forces creativity to be able to say, okay, inside of this box, whatever that, I mean, it needs, needs to be a reasonable box. I mean, I can't say build this amazing house and you got a hundred thousand dollars to spend. So it has to be a reasonable box, but having parameters creates or enables that creativity or or generates that creativity because you know inside of this this is a puzzle i have to solve does that match your experience i love that that's exactly right yeah and 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 a great director is a is a director a great leadership is the one that's going to establish those parameters what that does for the artist it's the same thing as parenting the same thing as parenting a good parent a successful parent creates parameters for their child to learn what do those parameters really give? Trust. Trust. It means I trust you, mom and dad, that this is a safe place for me. You know, I always equate, mm -hmm. I have a, I'm a visual person, so I always equate production, animation, storytelling, filmmaking, as you're walking on a tightrope. You are walking on a tightrope. And what does it mean? You could fail. And guess what? I've had, I've had failure. I have been... My first movie I was directing at Disney was a Winnie the Pooh movie called Winnie the Pooh Springtime with Rue. Well, it wasn't called that originally. It was called Winnie the Pooh and the Never Found Egg. And I spent a year with my co-director writing an Indiana Jones style animated film where little Rue is going on adventure to impress all his friends by finding the biggest Easter egg that no one's ever believes is real. It's a legend. And we spent a couple million dollars, had all these artists, paintings, animation, and we show it to the executive and at the end he turns the lights on and he goes, I don't know what this movie's about. Hmm. And my heart rate, my first movie as a director, I'm 29 years old, just moved out to LA, just got married. Am I going to get fired? Like what's going to happen? Like, it's scary. And he says, I'm just not behind the character. And my other executive right below him says to us, we're going to meet tomorrow morning. And it's bad. My manager on the phone, my agents, like they're gonna, they're probably gonna let you go. Me and the co-director, we stay up all night. Instead of coming in the next day and having them say to us, "Oh, you, this is why we're letting you go," we worked hard to create an entire new story. Like, what was wrong with it? What was the feedback mm -hmm. he gave us? Eventually, we pitched him that morning. We walked in. We said, "Well, we hear what you said, but we had this idea." We pitched them a whole other movie, and they loved it. Boom, we went with it. Here's the thing, making production is difficult. You're gonna have fear of failure. You're walking on a tightrope. You could fall at any moment and die. Great leadership is, I'm gonna give you the net underneath. That means I know that you could fail, it's okay. It's okay. The first executive, when he put those lights on, we were terrified. But it's the next day when we went to the one who was right below, and she's like, you know what? This, I got mm -hmm. you. I, I appreciate that you were empowered to put something out there. Was it perfect the next day? No. But she's like, oh, these are the kind of guys I can work with. Right. And I always say now as leadership, it is our job to people know that they're, you're not going to get fired for making a mistake if you've tried. And guess what else? Be vulnerable to the team. Be vulnerable to me. I tell this to my, especially these people that start up, 
especially my 20 year old animators that are just starting all the time. I say to them, you don't have to impress me. <laughs> impress me? Come talk to me. Tell me about your challenge. If you're not going to get your scene animated by the time we need it to make our quota, tell me when you start that and I'll get resources to help you. So important that people can be vulnerable in the workplace. And I've had times, I'll tell you one other quick story. We had this, and a lot of people listening will relate to this. A lot of big companies have that yearly retreat. Right. Where they all get together and they bring in outside motivational speakers and then they do these breakout groups and they're going to talk about the culture. We've all done that. Most people, when they know that that retreat day is coming up, they're like, oh gosh, here we go again. More like fluff. I'm going to have to hear more right. meetings. But then they're thinking, yeah, but it's at a nice hotel. At least, we'll eat, at least we'll eat good. Maybe we'll get some drinks at the buffet. Fine. So we go to one of these and they bring in this outside speaker. And this guy is like, it's really important to be vulnerable and to really share what you're feeling. Does anyone feel the courage to share? And I was just starting as a director at Disney. I raised my hand and my co-director's like taking my hand and putting it down. I was like, don't. But no, I, I got something to share. And I said that there was a gentleman who was leading all the voice directing. When you watch an animated film, all the voices are recorded beforehand, before you animate. And as a director, usually the directors will direct the voice talent, but they'll have somebody that supervises all of it who will lead the voice directing. They're called the voice directing supervisor. And the voice directing supervisor we were working with, we didn't gel so well. And I could tell that when me and the other co-director co were not happy with a read that was coming out with an actor, you have a big actor in there, David Spade, James Woods, we had Eartha Kitt. I was directing Kronk's New Groove, the sequel to Emperor's New Groove. It's the big celebrities in there. And sometimes you hear a word and you don't like it the way you, you want to hear it a different way. So I got to get this supervisor to go, can you just have her do it a little bit differently? He just wasn't open. He mm -hmm. wanted to lead the whole thing. He wasn't playing well with the directors of the movie. So I brought that up. I said, you know what? There's a voice person and he's in the room. They said you got to be vulnerable. And I think I did it in a respectful way. I said, yeah, yeah, this is a voice guy. And I feel like we don't really collaborate. I wish we could, wish we could be more vulnerable with each other. And, and, the, and the guy who was leading the whole thing was like, yeah, that's really great that you brought that up. That voice guy almost never spoke to me again. Mm -hmm. Almost never spoke to me again. And it really was the ruining of our relationship for the next two movies we did together. You thought it was awkward before? It was terrible. So I learned a lesson. Yeah, on paper. People will say, oh, yeah, it's good to be collaborative, to be vulnerable. It's good. But in reality, if we don't put our egos to the side, there's never going to be a space for vulnerability. And there will never be a space for real communication. And when you find the last project I, I was producing at DreamWorks, I was with the greatest team. Executive producer, line producer, and I was the supervising producer. The three of us were the top leadership of the show for four years zero ego from any of us. Never, never an argument, a fight. Did we have a difference of opinion? Of course. In any great partnership, if two people always have the same point of view, one person is useless. You want the other person to challenge sure. you. You want that. Or do you? Because if you really want that, man, you keep that ego to the side, yep. you can collaborate. You can create. Yeah, it's one of the, in the system that we teach, as our listeners know, um, we establish a set of behaviors or we call them fundamentals for, this is, these are the fundamentals for how we operate in this company. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that is most common, it certainly it's one in my company, we call it check the ego at the door. Oh, it. And it's interesting how, you know, when we talk about checking the ego at the door, what I have found is that um, there are many people who don't appreciate the ways, the subtle ways in which ego actually shows up in ways that you might not think of. So often when people hear, check the ego at the door, they're envisioning the prima donna with the big ego. And yet there are a lot of other ways, like, you know, as a small example, if somebody's unwilling to ask for help, why are they unwilling to ask for help? Because their ego's involved, because they don't want to look vulnerable or they don't want to look incapable or don't want to look incompetent. And so they don't want to speak up because that might make them look bad. That's their ego involved. That's exactly right. And so there are so many places in, in, in just our daily communication in which ego plays a role. And when you learn to check that at the door, I always say it creates greater intellectual freedom. Mm. If I'm not married to my ideas, 
because they're not me. They're just ideas that are separate from me. I can throw my idea out on the table, whether it's in a creative situation or not. Mm. I can throw my idea on the table and you can throw yours on and someone else can throw theirs on and we can all massage it and play with it and figure out what's going to be the best because none of us is tied to that. Yeah. Um, and so there's an intellectual freedom that comes from checking it with the ego. At the oh, door. it's so good. And let me give you, a, this is a fail. You know, I've had success and failure, I guess, like everyone, or at least... I hope everyone's had both. <laughs> um, my first movie I was directing, um, Winnie the Pooh, we did that movie and it was a real hit for the Walt Disney Company. After that, there was another movie, Kronk's New Groove. Like I said, the sequel to Emperor's New Groove. It was failing. They had another director on for a year. They're going to pull the plug on the whole movie. And because me and my co-director did so well with Winnie the Pooh, they brought us into a meeting and they said, look, here's the deal. We just fired the director of this movie. And we think the movie's in shambles. We've spent, I don't know, $15 million at this point. We're going to give this movie to you on the animatic to look at it. If you guys think you can salvage this movie, we'll make it. If you tell us it's not savable, we're mm -hmm. going to cut it. So that night we go through the movie and we look at it and we're like, you know what? It, it's not great. And should it be redesigned like this? Yeah. It's like I always say, it's like a boat that's sinking. You can't say while well, it's sinking, you know, it should have been designed differently. Because as you're thinking that, you're going to sink. What you got to do is just patch the boat. Just got to patch it. Get it to float. And that's what we did on that movie. And because it was so successful, the way we patched the boat, we fixed that movie, we became the hot shot directors at the company. Our agent negotiated a new deal for us. We got private offices, private parking spots. We were the golden boys, resented by many, by the way. Because we were the guys that just came in and only did two movies and were already soaring. And then we became staff directors what did that mean it meant not only are we going to direct the movie that we have responsibilities to they're going to put us on every movie that needs help or that mm -hmm. might not even know they need help so we started having schedules in our day where we're looking at bambi 2 that they're making another dumbo movie tinkerbell whatever so what happened i started to get this ego of i'm pretty good at my job i'm pretty good at storytelling right this is i can do this so one day we get called into a room. There is a movie that is failing. I don't remember what it was. And they bring in all the directors and all the writers. Now, this is something, by the way, that Pixar did. It's called a brain trust. A brain trust is a creative group of leadership where all other leadership in the similar capacity come in to help each other out. Hey, this is my movie. Any ideas from other directors? It could be like, you know, one hour a month, whatever. So I see this, what's broken in this movie. And I'm like... I got to fix this. I got to fix this. That was my, just walking into that because mm -hmm. this is the time when I was entering the room with all the other directors and I got to show them my stuff. Mm. The problem is I started that sentence or at least that thought with the word I, and I'm listening to the story problems and I had the idea to fix it. And even looking back now, was the idea brilliant that I came up with? Yeah, it was brilliant. But when I left the meeting, I go back to my desk. And my co-director said, you know what? You were out of line in there. I said, what do you mean, dude? Didn't you love the idea? I came up with, look what I did. He's like, no, you don't get it. You bulldozed. You bulldozed. No, but I'm the nice guy. No, no, you weren't really listening. You see, my attitude walking into that meeting was, I need to prove to them what I could do. Right. You know what it should have been? I need to serve others. How can I listen and serve others in their goal. And I will tell you from that moment on, I still get goosebumps thinking of this. And, and this is a tool that all of us should do. And we should subscribe to it. And you may be listening to this right now and going, no, I do this. I do. Yeah, I got this down. Well, hold on. Do you? Do not search for credit. Do not search for credit. As a matter of fact, be the one that runs from honor. When they want to say who did... Let someone else call your phrases. Does that mean that you shouldn't get credit for what you do, like monetarily? Hey, if you want someone else getting the money because you're, you want sure. people to notice, <clears throat> but don't speak up for yourself and just be the person who is the one that just does the job and wants to serve the team. And I'm telling you just in, in leadership now, because at that point I was just beginning my leadership. Right Now, 15 years later, that's the kind of people I want to work with. That's the culture I want to create. Yeah. So take a step back here and we're talking about the ways that a successful culture operates. We're checking the ego at their door. We're serving others. We're 
pushing away from taking credit for things. We're listening more. We call it listening generously. Um, we're allowing people the freedom to try new things without worrying about failing um, or the consequences of failing. So we're doing a lot of good things. And what I'm curious about and, and, and some things that, that I think a lot about is, okay, how do I as a leader systematically create that? In other words, we know that that culture that's created that you're describing, and whether it's in a creative environment or, or any other kind of business, that that culture is really important. In fact, it's one of the most important things that drives the success of the organization. And my contention is that given how important culture is, we ought not to just leave it to the whims of, well, you know, we kind of have this nice culture, but that we ought to be as process oriented about building our culture as we are about our sales or finances, our creativity or any yeah. other important aspects of this business. So what would you offer to people as to, okay, you're the leader of, forget that it's an animation studio, it's yeah. any other kind of organization. Yeah. How do I approach culture from a more process standpoint from your experience or perspective? Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of back, it harkens back to the story I told about Michael Jordan wanting to know his weakness. So whatever we're creating in our business, whatever product we're creating, we all have a deadline. And there's always a point where that completion of that product is done. And you got to put it mm -hmm. out there. And, you know, one time we had a screening of our movie, Kronk's New Groove, for the executive, the, the intimidating executive, the one that ran the studio. And we're in the theater and we show him the movie. And afterwards, the lights go on and we go into the, the little room there. And we're going to get his notes. He walks in the room and he says, I got no notes. What? Like, that's never happened. You just watched an 88-minute movie and you don't have one note of how to make something better. And this wasn't, you know, I got to get to my son's uh, play, so I'm just going to not give you notes. No, he's like, I have nowhere to go. I'm, I just keep doing what you're doing. The comedy's playing. The emotions are working. The pacing was great. The voice, it's great. Just keep going. And he leaves the room. There's a pause. And everyone's like, woo, clapping. It's just like 15 of us in the room. We go back to our team where we have 80 artists, the whole team at the wing at the studio. We walk in there and we get a standing ovation. There's no notes. And I remember going back to my desk and I felt deflated. Why would you feel deflated? He told you your movie is perfect. There's always things you can make better. There's always obviously. things you can make better. And the question is, do we really want to see those things that we make better? What are we going for? Are we going for the, I want my boss to say, I did a perfect job? Or am I going to create something that's perfect? There's a difference. Because at the end of the day, whenever we're making that product, in my case, a movie, there's a day where the movie is over. And it goes up on the screen. And for the next 100 years, you can't change a camera move. You can't change one more line. So we have to use all resources, all tools to make it the best it can be in that moment. So what's the idea? The idea is for the culture of creating whatever we're doing, we have to empower those around us to give us notes. When I was working on Mulan, I remember when I was starting out as an animator, we would go to these screenings. The directors would present the movie. We'd all go back to our desks and we would bash the movie to each other. We'd like, yeah, this is working good, but man, that joke sucked and that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I became a director, I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to know that my animators and artists are at their desk bashing the movie. I want to hear the bashing. So you ask the question, David, what can we do? Well, here's what we did. At the end of the screenings with our team, we made an announcement. We want notes from who? From anybody. You could be a storyboard artist and you don't like something in the color. Tell us about it. You could be an animator. Tell us you don't like the way a voice was recorded. Tell us about it. And we set up a suggestion box. We said you can write your names on it or you can make it anonymous. And let me tell you, 15% of the greatest notes I ever got on that movie came from that box. It's one thing, like I said, as a leader to say, yeah, of course I want to be open to direction or ideas from anybody. But do you live it? Do you live that culture, create an environment where from the top, you're telling people, tell me where my flaws are. And if yeah. they can see that, 
then in their jobs, they're going to be more vulnerable and be open. Hey, let me tell you where my flaws are. That's the culture you want. And um, I'll tell you, Steve Jobs, actually, George Lucas, one of the first movies he made was um, THX 1138. It was a short film in school, but the real first hit that he ever had was American Graffiti. That, that's, the, that's the movie that put him on the map. He makes this movie and it is exactly what he wants. Every frame of it is exactly what he wants. He was asked a couple years after the movie Star Wars came out, they said, George, what was different about Star Wars that made it such a bigger hit than American Graffiti? George says one thing. He goes, there was a day on Star Wars where I realized I couldn't make the movie exactly the way I wanted it. It was too big. And what did I do? I, I opened up my ears more and I listened more and I empowered people around me to do their jobs. That's why Star Wars is Star Wars. He was forced into it. And you can imagine right before that where he was must have been like controlling everything. Mm -hmm. James Cameron, Titanic. I mean, he's a dictator on the set. He wants everything his way. But there's many stories told of him still empowering those around him. A director has the vision of where we're going, but he has to empower his team to allow us all to get there. And that really comes down to one quality. It's a humility. It really is a humility. Humility is... It, it, humility breeds unity. You have to be unified. The only way you're going to be uni you're going to have unity is if you have the humility to realize the goal is not me. It's what we create. Mm -hmm. And when you have that unity and that humility, boom, <laughs> you get Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, and and I think you know what what I'm looking for is, and for our audience' sake, are the systems and processes we can create to make that happen. So let me give you an example. You know, you're talking about the notes. Um, I've spoken to a number of people that have come from the military. And in the military, there is a very specific after action uh, debrief process where it is a very rigorous process of going through after something happened, after every flight, after every mission, all right, we go through and we're very accountable to each other. What are the things that we did well that we should repeat? What are the things that we didn't do so well that you know should that, that we need to fix? And how do we fix those things? We make sure the next mission is even more successful. Yeah. And it's a very structured, systematic process. It's not a suggestion box. Right, right. Guys, if you have any suggestions, let us know. Right. There's a process, there's a structure, there's a system to that. Beautiful. So what I'm looking for is... How do we create more structure? Yes, we can all be nice people and I could be a very vulnerable leader and I could encourage people to try new things and I could create the safety net for them and I can do all these things, but that's based on me as a leader. How do I create a structure, a system, a process so that this is a repeatable thing in an organization? Yeah, so the only way, in my humble opinion, to do that mm -hmm. is you have to have, you have, to have what's, what I call set times. Mm -hmm. You have to have it scheduled in there. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Many people would tell you that it is imperative to exhibit empathy as a leader. You have to exhibit empathy. From 10 to 10.30, I'm going to be empathetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Like You have to yeah. empathize with your people. You know, I remember when I hired every single person I hired at DreamWorks, and I was interviewing artists you know, in their 20s, starting out in their career. Maybe it's their second job. And they're wide-eyed and they're excited. And I would say to them, is it great to be a DreamWorks? It's great. Is it great to be working on a Madagascar franchise? It's great. But if I said to them, if you don't go home every day feeling appreciated, heard, and that you're contributing to this and that you feel respected, who cares? So what does that tell them right from this first day? It says, you know what? I'm empathizing that I know what you want. What do they want? They want inspiration. They want to be part of the magic. When I started at Disney, I wanted to work on movies like that inspired me when I was a kid. Pinocchio, Cinderella, Lion King. So tell me more about how you set, right. how you do that. So and by the way, times. I had bosses at Disney that were terrible to me, that, that would degrade me. I remember mm -hmm. I was giving a celebrity a tour. It was uh, Billy D. Williams, Colt 45. Remember that actor? I was touring mm -hmm. around the animation studio. I bring him into the room I'm in. And I'm introducing him around. I go, oh, this is Billy Dewey. This is this is this person that I work with. This is this, this is this person that I work with. We work on the same character. She stops me in front of him and goes, No, no, no. We don't work together. You work for me. Hmm. There's no empathy there. 
So, so go so, back to so. So how do you, you set, set the time? time? What's the tool? The tool is, it's I call them check ins, and I have okay. them scheduled in my morning at certain points. I have thirty minutes where I can walk to any animator, any artist, and do what I call it's a pop in. Is really what I call it. I call it a pop in. A pop in is I show up at your desk. And let me tell you something. The first time I do this to an artist, they're sitting at their desk working, and the director comes by, the producer comes by, they freak out for a second. Because there's protocols. The director doesn't get, there's usually a meeting. And I come by. And you know what I do? I ask them a question. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. They'll say, I'm like, yeah, tell me. What are you working on? They'll show me the scene. Two minutes into it, we're having a creative conversation. They're saying, hey, I'm thinking about this. And I don't always have to say, well, this is what I would do. This is what I would do. I, don't, I never say that. The point about empathizing is hearing them. Letting them know that I understand what you're going through. And then I walk away from their desk and they're like, holy crap, I matter. He cares about me. And because I went and popped into them and I've told them many times, let me know if you ever want to pop into me. And that bridges a relationship. Mm -hmm. So I could have been in my desk and I could have made a big announcement. Anyone, hey, if you ever need anything, come by. No one's going to come by. Right. So what's the tool? Scheduled pop-ins. And I have a checklist of every artist and I will pop into everybody at certain points. Very, mm -hmm. very important. The pop yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Let them know you care. Let them know you care yeah. what they're going through. Your problem is our problem. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. So I want to just bring us to some closure around this. So um if you were to if you were to distill, this is a, hard to summarize this, but if you were to distill the things you've learned about the importance of culture in building a successful organization, you were to distill it to the single most important ingredient, what would it be? Every single person on the planet, as different as we are, culturally, religious, diverse, age, every single person wants the same thing. If you ask 99% of the world, what do you want? Everyone's going to tell you, I want to be happy. I want to be happy. I do these things because it's going to bring me happiness. But there's actually something much sweeter than a life of happiness. You see, because happiness for most of us is usually contingent on outside experiences. Mm -hmm. If I reach this goal, I'll be happy. If I meet my soulmate, I'll be happy. If I can add two zeros to my bank statement, I would be happy. But sweeter than a life of happiness is a life of meaning. A meaningful life. What does that mean? That means each one of us, do we want happiness? Yeah. We want a meaningful life. And that means I want to know that my life matters. I want to contribute to something bigger than me. The first thing I ever did in my life was I drew. I was an artist. And I will tell you, every artist wants the same thing. They want their artwork in the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Louvre because after I leave my blink of an eye thing called life, I want to know that I left a mark. Steve Jobs said it this way. He said, I just wanted to make a dent in the earth. Just make a dent. Make an impact. And by the way, the first museum my artwork ever, hang, ever hung was the refrigerator, my mom's fridge. That was the first pleasure I got. The number one thing, to answer your question, the number one thing I think that we have to realize in our minds, and it has to lead all of the culture that we create, whatever it is, is that we need to inspire those around us to leave a dent in whatever we're creating. Leave a dent. Meaningful mm -hmm. life comes from how do I take what makes me unique, my unique passions, my unique abilities, and use them as a responsibility. You see, responsibility is wherever I have the ability to respond. And every single person, because we're unique, we want to contribute something, mm -hmm. that little mark. And great leadership, great leadership is aware that I not want someone else's help. I need it. Mm -hmm. It's only when I get it. You know, I'm sure that Steve Jobs, when he finished creating the first iPhone, he probably took that iPhone, held it up in front of his people. They probably brought in champagne. They had a great thing. Congratulations. Look what we did. And I bet the next morning he probably came in and said, now tell me, how are we going to make this better? Right. Not how am I going to make it better? How are we going to do this? Yeah. That's what I think it is. It, it's, cool. it's, it's inspire people to know they're contributing to something bigger than them and, uh, and hopefully making a dent along the way.
Great. Appreciate it. So Saul, this has been a pleasure. Um, if people want to learn more about you, your background, how you can help them, your speaking, where do they go? Thank you so much. Yes. Um, please check out my website. It's Saul, S-A-U-L, Blinkoff.com. On there, you will have access to everything I'm doing. The podcast that I do is called Life of Awesome. It's for everybody. Kids, teens, singles, married, every age. It's, uh, it's a podcast that empower us to not just settle for good when we can have great and not settle for great when we can have awesome. So life of awesome. Also, I'm on Instagram, Saul.Blinkoff. I'm also on TikTok. Um, you can follow me there and check out, you know, like I said, I do corporate keynotes and speaking. I work on animation projects and whatever it is that I do, I'm always just trying to, uh, to make an impact in, in some small way. So I really appreciate you uh, having me, David. And I also encourage all your listeners, you know, if you felt any inspiration from this interview, and I hope that you have, um, be careful because inspiration comes and goes. Inspiration can slip through your fingertips. You know, one day you hear a podcast, you watch a TED talk, you read a book and you feel inspired. The fire's going, the emotion's going, your heart is racing. It's exciting. The next day, wait, what did he say? What did she say? And you just go back to your same life. If we go back to our same lives after listening to an interview, then we've wasted our time, which is the most valuable thing we have. The goal has to be to take a new mindset, a new idea, and transform it not into what we believe, but what we do. How do we turn it into action? Don't just be inspired, live inspired, and take actionable steps to create the culture of what you want to create and ultimately who you want to become along the way. Well, thank you, Saul. Uh, I appreciate the chance to be with you and uh, you sharing your wisdom with our audience. Thank you, David, so much. Be well. All right. Have an Thanks awesome too. day. Thanks. <laughs> and that's it for this Culture Architect session with Saul Blinkoff, Disney animator, Hollywood director and producer, and life coach. Folks, if you've been enjoying our show, be sure to subscribe, and that way you'll automatically get my new episodes whenever they come out. Also, if you have a minute, I'd love it if you left us a review, and that way more culture fans like you can discover the show. See you next time on Culture Architects. This has been Culture Architects with David J. Friedman. Join us next time for more insights and wisdom from great leaders in all walks of life. To book David for your next event, or to learn more about his writing, speaking, or consulting, go to davidjfreeman.com. Culture Architects with David J. Friedman is a production of CultureWise.